there he is. The legend himself, Coach Dan Mullen. Coach Mullen, what's going on, man? How we doing today? Uh, not much. How are you guys doing today? How's the seminar going? <laughs> Just asking Aaron about it. Have you been sitting in this ESPN <laughs> seminar as well? That's what I was, I was. I got lost on time with the seminar right there. So sorry, I'm late. I was listening to, not that I haven't heard enough of like Steve Shaw and the officiating throughout the years. <laughs> I mean, I've sat through that meeting so many different times. It's unbelievable. Uh, but, uh, you know, just uh, kind of caught in where they were going and what they, how they wanted to enforce some of the new rules. Yeah, man. Um, huge thanks for joining us today, Coach. Uh, you know, it's a it's a big day. I was listening to you and Matt Barry chop it up earlier. It's college football week zero. Swamp Kings is coming out. Got a lot that we want to dive in with you today. Uh, real quick, though, this season, Coach, of what? You're going to be in studio Thursday. You no, know, you're calling a game on Thursday, right, with Barry. You'll be calling games on Thursday, studio Friday, Saturday? Yeah, so it'll be really exciting. You know, getting to call that Thursday night game of the week on ESPN is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, obviously Matt and I, you know, we're going to get to spend an awful lot of time together because we're going to be flying out, getting ready to do the game Wednesday, doing the game Thursday night. We'll probably be both on the same flight wherever we're leaving from back to Bristol Friday morning. Uh, we get the studio Friday night and then we get that, that long day Saturday ESPN. The, the, the funny one is, I mean, we get the, the football Mecca, right? I mean, we sit in this room on a studio. There's about, I think there's 16 TVs in front of us. Ooh. Um, mm -hmm. but I'm telling you what, you got, you have the noon game, the three 30, the seven, the 10 30, then we roll into college football final after that. So it's, uh, Jeez. we'll, we'll be, we'll be ready for a little breather come Sunday morning. Hey, T-Bob coach thought he was saying, you know, get some time off when he's not coaching and having to recruit yet. He's going to be doing ESPN for five days out of the week. Uh, true, <laughs> but I would still venture to guess coach. I'll let you weigh in here. Uh, it's still got to be a significantly lighter workload than having to call 718 year olds every day. I'm bringing broke up on me on that one. What was that? I was just saying, compare, compare, okay, because Aaron was talking about your large workload at ESPN there. Compare that to when you were uh, the head coach of a major college football program. Like, still can't even be close. No, no, it's not even in, in, in the same deal. Because, you know what, the, 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 the one thing when you're uh, running a, a, a major program, you work 24-7, 365. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you're on call all the time. You're constantly recruiting. You're dealing, you got the player issues. You, there's so many different things that you're, you know, when the, I, I guess, the job, you never leave the job and go home or go from the job and you're, you know, you're always, you work. That's it. That's, that's yeah. all it is. Um, and it's all, I love that, but it is, it's such a different lifestyle being able to sit there and say, okay, well, Hey, I know I'm going to my son's game on a Thursday afternoon. That's there's there's nothing that's really popping up uh, on the schedule that takes away from that. Or and, you know, I'm you know, I, I can kind of lay out what's going on. I know, you know, we're our first Thursday night game is going to be Memphis Navy. I can go watch some of the film. I watch some of that film the first two weeks. Hell yeah. Um, I'll be the game. And, and then I, I I know I'm flying home every Sunday morning at a certain time for Bristol. And, you know, when you're when you're running a college football program, it's 24-7, 365. You never know when when the call's coming, what you got to deal with, um, you know, and, it, and it's year round. So it's um, it, it is a it, it, I don't want to say it's easy because I know I mean, as you guys know, we put a lot of work, a lot of work easy, in coach. It is, dude. It is. It is. Easy. <laughs> it's, it's hard, to coach, but it's also still not completely normal. Like. You know, the person no. that, I don't know that anybody works like nine to five, Monday to Friday, but people that, that generally work Monday to Friday jobs, we still don't have one of those jobs, you know. True, uh, true. I've set, I mean, I guess that now I have set vacation, which is a long extended spring vacation. But if someone calls and says, hey, we're going to do this golf trip the, the second week of October. No. I already know where I'm going to be. I like. I wish I should probably be able to reel it off. I think I'm like in coastal Carolina or East Carolina or something. Then in Bristol, like you, you just have your 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 job when you're in the business we're in. Everything's very structured. I, I'm uh -huh. going to be in Starkville, and I've spent a lot of Thanksgivings in Starkville. Be a little bit different this year. <laughs> and then, you know, but yeah, I, I always laugh when you get in what we do in, in coaching. 
when you're coaching, it's not really the job, but don't forget about it. Like we are right now, you're, you're in the entertainment business. You know, the product yep. you're producing is entertainment for other people. That's not True. the job, but that's the, what, what you're producing. Yep. Um, and you're in that you want to people when they're off. So the normal people, when they're off, they want to be entertained. So we're always working when other people are off. Yeah. yeah. Go, Go ahead, Aaron. So I, I, I want to kind of shift it real quick. Um, so we had this whole thing the other day of, of who's the most underrated player of all time. And T-Bob came to one of your boys' defense here, Chris Leak. I know you talked about that first year with Matt Barry the other day about, you know, it was really Chris's team. 90% of the reps went to Chris. T-Bob would come in for a small package. But a lot of people still don't really give Chris all the kind of credit. I mean, in your mind – is he up there with one of the most underrated players of all time when it comes to college football? I think a lot of what happens, and I think when you know this, because you look at the list you're on of like passing leaders and all time yardage yep. leaders in SEC quarterbacks. I mean, Chris Leak's on that list. I know. And he doesn't get, I, even on the championship he won, the national title he won, he does share a lot of credit with Tebow. And now, yeah. I think a lot of that is Tim made a lot of big plays during that. I think that Tim is one of the most, if not, you know, I mean, he's one of the most recognizable names in college football history. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I think that so much gets washed in. I mean, even, even the national championship game, you know, Tim had multiple touchdowns as a freshman. Now, Chris kind of played almost all the plays. But on third goal from the one, he came out and Tebow ran QB power and bull bulldozed everybody into the end zone, you know? No. Um, and then he fit and threw a flat route. And, you know, so I think Chris, for what he did for that team and how much he was responsible for all the wins, Tim had a lot of highlights. So I, I think easily he is one of the more underrated players that are out there when you look at the body of work in his career – statistically, the fact that he's won an SEC and a national championship as a starting quarterback, uh, and the guy that was the backup that got as much credit for it as he did. And uh, so that, that, that puts him up there. Uh, Coach, so I don't, I don't want to spend too long in here because I want to pick your brain about the actual football, but uh, Swamp Kings did drop today. I haven't got a chance to watch it yet. I know you're in it. Uh, what was it like kind of revisiting? I mean, those are the floor, that era of Florida. I was at LSU 07 through 11. Like, that's the era of Florida that I absolutely hated. I <laughs> loathed Brandon Spikes. Um, I'll forget. I mean, the probably my favorite win I ever had in my career was winning there in 2010 and immediately just stomping on the F because, like, they had stomped on the I in Tiger Stadium. I mean, those are some dogs. What was it like kind of revisiting that era of time for you? It was a lot of fun. I guess that's what makes the, the Netflix. I haven't watched it. I haven't seen it yet. I didn't, they didn't, I didn't get the preview of it sent to me. Uh, but, uh, and then I'm not, I'm not starting it to my son. My son would freak out if I started watching, if we don't watch it together. So <laughs> okay, yeah. um, the, uh, I'll tell you what, it's a lot of fun, but I mean, like you said, what was really interesting and fun, the, 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 the guys and all the characters that were on those teams between kind of two different, like I, I, it's one error with two very different teams, the 06 national title and the 08 national title. True. There were crossover players, but I mean, they were two very different. The majority uh, were, were very different people. And, uh, and the stars on that team were very different people. And uh, so it was a lot of fun. I think what makes the show so special and what's everybody interested in, as you said, man, I think back then people either loved Florida or hated Florida. And there, there mm. was not a in between, you know, no. I mean, there was, there was not a like, Hey, I'm all in or I'm all out. Like, you know, you were the, you were kind of the, if you were a Florida fan or you liked the Gators or you were into that, they, they were the team. Um, you know, I mean, kind of goes back to watching some of the, the, the you specials on you that Florida error probably had some similarities to that where people mm -hmm. loved them or hated mm -hmm. them. And uh, I think that's, what's gotten everybody so excited about the Netflix show. 
I'll never you and I talked about this a little bit a few weeks ago, Coach, and I don't know how much they're going to talk about Aaron Hernandez in this special because just like Manziel, you didn't see a lot of those players because it's you don't want to talk bad about one of your teammates, regardless of what may or may that have had. But how was he to coach and how was he as a teammate? Because I feel like the perception is probably completely different from what we view on the outside. I think it is. I think I think Aaron's, Aaron's life after Florida, Aaron's life away from football has a certain um, perception about it. And, and people, you know, uh, there, there's so much said about it. But I think the people that knew him in football, you know, the people you are around him in the locker room every day and during his time and his playing times, I, there, there are people that that I, that I know everybody loved Aaron Hernandez for that you know that that guy that was in the locker room that that competed loved football you know was was it was a great teammate around everybody in the building as you said i think it does make it hard because there was so much that happened um away from football and especially away from florida later on that was different than the person that a lot of people knew and yeah I, and and so I, I think it is, you know, it, you, you have a lot of people that are out there that are going to be very hesitant how much they get into Aaron Hernandez because, um, you know, it's almost, I mean, in a, in a, in a sense, you, you could go like, a, it's like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde story. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Of, mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, I, and I don't just kind of cut it too much. But there is very extremes to the Aaron Hernandez that's out there. And I think people know very, very different sides of them. Yeah. And it's really a story that is just tragic kind of all the way around um, by the end of it. But, uh, okay, this is the impossible pivot that you have to do in sports <laughs> talk when you get into something serious. So we'll just kind of steer the ship and deal with the whiplash here. Uh, I, I do, I do want to talk about the upcoming season, man. It's, it's week zero right now. Um, and I was driving over, here, I was like, what do I want to ask coach? And I'm listening to the interview with you, Matt, everything. And something popped in my head that I really want to pick your brain on, uh, out of Alabama right now. It seems like there is growing momentum that Jalen Milrow may be the guy out the gates. I am someone who I'm like, look, man, if nobody's grabbing that, like, why not maybe adopt a running, a rushing identity, go heavy on Milrow. And you're the perfect person to ask about this because you did this like you had great success running QB power with big dudes where maybe just throwing the ball constantly wasn't kind of their forte. And then all of a sudden you have Kyle Trask, everything changes and you're just like slinging it all over the field. Um, how realistic is it to think that Alabama could suddenly go back to maybe a bit more of a rushing team with a guy like Jalen Milrow, you know, taking advantage of a lot of those QB option packages? I think one thing that Nick Saban has done top of college football right now and i mean get away from having better players than just about everybody else, <laughs> right? that, that 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 certainly is not hurt yeah, that, helps. Right? <laughs> that doesn't hurt when you when you have the best players however he has not been afraid to evolve and no. he's not been afraid and i think one thing you do look i think there was a period of time where he did kind of get caught into coach. Oh, I want to run a certain style of offense. Mm -hmm. um, and this is how we're going to be no matter what, this is going to be our offense. And if you look, you know, after, you know, I want to go back probably around 2015, 16, I want to say around that time frame, you started to see an evolution of it of yeah. him being willing to really change things up offensively. And um, I think that's one of the things you'll see. It really would not shock me to see multiple quarterbacks at Alabama. And I'm, I, I guarantee you go find a clip of Nick Saban saying at a clinic or in a football lecture somewhere, if you have two quarterbacks, you have no quarterbacks, right? Like the, the, the classic set. Man, yeah. if, you, if you have two quarterbacks, you have none. I'm, I bet you can even find a Nick Saban statement making that. But he's not afraid to go against that. He's not afraid. He's going to do what, what is best for the team to win. Okay? And, you know, I think he's going to look at a Jalen Milrow and say, boy, 
you know, in the back of his mind, maybe hopefully, I mean, hopefully he just has a flash in me every once in a while. It, you know what? Dan Mullen ran this stuff again. I mean, like back in two, I mean, that <laughs> Nick Fitzgerald ran this play up and down the field and we were the number one team in the country and, yep. and they almost beat us. And I've watched Steve, I've watched Chris, I've watched these other quarterbacks do it. And that drove me crazy. So I don't mind having part of that in our system. Yep. Uh, but I, I also think, seen him do i mean i mean pulling jalen hurts i mean he i mm-hmm. you've seen him not be afraid to make tough decisions and i do think and aaron i i don't know that because you really i don't think i'm trying to probably haven't been a part of it but they'll understand this in the room you can run a multi-quarterback system as long as everybody in the room understands the plan and yeah. that that's what people on the outside probably don't get. The Chris Lee, Tim Tebow. Okay, now maybe twenty years. It's a lot of credit for it. going into every game. They knew the plan. I mean, if I go in my office right now, I have the Sports Illustrated picture, the cover picture, a poster like sized one, signed by Chris. Right? It's Chris Lee holding the crystal ball. So if oh, yeah. he had, Chris Lee got to hold the crystal ball. Now part of him holding the crystal ball was he needed Tebow to come in and run that package. No matter what, I needed him to do this for us to be successful. Going into the game, he knew the plan. So I, I wouldn't be shocked when when everybody knows the plan. It's not guys like looking over their shoulder at the quarterback competition. It is, this is the plan going in. People outside the building might not know it. People outside the building might not get it. But we know the plan going in, and as long as the coach is consistent, this is the plan, and we're following that plan, you're going to have success running that type of offense. Well, I'm not even worried about the offensive type. I'm more worried about, in today's game nowadays, winning a championship because that's 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 where Alabama must get to. They must get to Atlanta. They must be in the playoffs. They must compete for a national championship. But can you win a championship in 2023 – not having an explosive offense that throws the ball and can push the ball vertically down the field. I'm not saying can they win the majority of their games because, like you alluded to, they are more talented and they can bully and beat people up. But when you get to a point where you face another team that's just as big and strong as you, to me there has to be another dynamic to the offense. Can you win a championship if you don't have that? I think you can, but it's you got to get into the philosophy of we're going to – we're gonna dictate our style of play if they're going like Jalen Milrow running style quarterback ball control old school short in the game that puts pre- a different style of pressure on other teams right because you have to think you know like what you're going into in the last couple of years and you see these high powered offenses you're going into if teams are going to score a bunch of points you're getting uh, upwards of 15 possessions a game yeah. right in the course yeah. of a game. Yeah. Let's say Alabama is going to, we're going to slow it down this year. We're going to change it up. We're going to go run the quarterback. We're going to go be a defensive game. You're going to get eight possessions, nine possessions in a game. Let's say Alabama is only scoring 28 points a game. You have eight possessions. Mm. You better score a touchdown on 50% of your possessions or Shoot. against that Alabama defense. Yeah. Or you lose. And so I, I think as long as, organizationally i've always felt this that the key is is and that that's what nick will do is everyone's on the same page now can you know if that gets them into atlanta really you know in the sec it's a three-game playoff right you have the you have atlanta the semifinals and the championship you got to win all three of them um is that enough to win those three games against the potential enough to win against the Georgia possibly yeah. because Georgia might not be the high powered offense they've been in the past you know this year there's a couple of weapons missing and all of a sudden you start playing defense now you know they're going to play defense and all of a sudden that becomes more of a slobber knocker game okay mm-hmm. is it enough to get by potentially uh, a Caleb Williams led USC if they're in the playoffs or in a with wide outs everywhere that can score from anywhere on the field. That'll be interesting to see. But, you know, I, hey, it, 
Jim Harbaugh would probably invite that. That game might be over in about an hour and 25 minutes. <laughs> there, might, there, might, there might not be a, many passes thrown. It'd be like a uh, like a pitcher's duel. Yeah, uh, it'd be like Army Navy. It'll be faster than the Army Navy. But the, the, I, I think you can. Um, but again, I, I don't know, deep down inside with me, with that style, I think Nick would be in tune to possibly playing two quarterbacks. Uh, Coach, what about this? You kind of touched on it in that answer a little bit where you, you, you talk about Georgia and you're like, but who knows kind of what the Georgia offense is going to be. This is something that I am kind of staked. You know, I've, I've planted my flag in this real estate. going to hope that some gold shows up by the end of the year. But it's this idea that, uh, that with Carson Beck, like, I know he has all the measurables. He has all the physical talent. I know he's going to put up great numbers against that easy schedule. But why Georgia won Natties was Munkin and Bennett. Like, those were the final piece. Them being at their best against the best teams is what pushed Georgia across that finish line. I'm not convinced that I can just sit here and give Bobo the, and Beck the same benefit of that doubt. Where, where do you stand on that? Like, as a coach, is there any way of figuring out, can this guy handle the moment before they're just in that moment? Well, I think I think one the, the 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 they could is I don't know that Georgia's schedule would even allow them to stub their toe before they got to Atlanta. No, I'm talking playoffs. I'm talking playoffs with only. The like they, they right, the playoff. With the exception is they've won, and all of a sudden when you win, the mindset kind of can change. You know, there's a lot of guys on this team that maybe didn't have to work as hard to get to the championship level. And it's just expected to be given to them. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Kirby's. Battles. He has to one fight against that. He has to two come in. And obviously, Aaron would probably answer this better than us. The one thing I do think, you know, Kirby, again, when you have defensive head coaches, you know, I, I can just, and I don't know, you probably, Aaron probably like knows the inner circle a lot more. <laughs> is Kirby on the phone and, and some of those conversations with Todd Munkin, which is let's run the ball. Like, so, so, like, hey, let's get in multiple tight ends and be a power formation. So, what did the most dynamic receiving tight ends he could? So they didn't have to have receivers on the field, but he could still throw the ball all over the place. Right. <laughs> and, uh, now, with that moving forward, is is Mike Bobo going to be able to come in and keep this quality maybe that Todd Munkins had over the last couple of years? Mm. Or are they going to go back to, you know, some early Kirby, which you, where, where it's, hey, mm. let's play, let's win with defense. You know, let's not turn it over. Let's not take chances. Let's be a power run team and let, let's really try to win with defense. Or are they going to have the mindset to keep it wide open? And I think I don't know. I, I'm, I'm I, think, I, think what, I think I think if you wanted to be more of a run first offense, you wouldn't have gotten two of the best receiver transfers in the portal, and you would have made Carson Beck your starting quarterback. Copium, copium. Dare say whatever you got to say, dude. We'll see. <laughs> I mean, Wayne C. Like to me, the weapon. And, Making Carson your quarterback signals to me that you want to you want to let and then plus the biggest question for Georgia this year is the running backs like they're not healthy there isn't a a stud number one it's kind of running back by committee I don't know I mean balance is key but I think their 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 goal and kind of you know knowing Bobo's personality their goal is to score over forty points per game and kind of give an effort uh, so we'll see Co Coach last quick one for me because I don't want to kind of tie this back to Florida real quick and and just the quarterback position in general. You coach two of the greatest quarterbacks in college football history. T. Bob and I have debated who's one, who's two, who's three between those two: um, Cam Newton, Tim Tebow, and Joe Burrow. If you want to start a football team today, the Dan oh, Mullen football team, look at this. who are you picking? Rank your one through three of who you would want, or do the uh, do the whole what is it? Start bench cut. Who are you starting? Who are you benching? Who are you cutting? <laughs> The no Burrow version of Mary Hill. <laughs> Start Vince yeah. Cut. <laughs> that, that's always that's always that's such a tricky one, right? One with Joe Burrow is I was never around Joe that much to get to know him yeah. inside and out. Um, so that that's a hard one, personality one. If I'm starting a college football team, 
you're going with Tim Tebow. You know, I'm not, not NFL, not not long term. I, listen, yeah. I, I I'll give you this. I don't know. I think Tim Tebow's the greatest college football player in the history of the game. Okay. I don't think I can share. It. He might not have been the most talented quarterback on the roster. He certainly is not the most talented player on the roster. That definitely would have been Percy Harvin. Yeah. Uh, but in okay, in college football, I think he is okay. He, he won a Heisman. Probably yep. should have won more than one. But mm-hmm. because he won one, they're not going to give him a second. So I think he yeah. won one and was runner-up t- two more times, right? Three-time All-American. I don't know how many Maxwells and Davey O'Briens and all that. <laughs> won, right? He won two SEC championships, two national championships. I, I, you know, he's one of the all-time leading touchdown pass passers in the SEC and all-time leading touchdown rushers in the SEC. It, it just is. Uh, that puts him in college football. Now, when you're going, Cam's probably more talented. I have both of them. Cam is more talented. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I didn't have Joe. Joe Burrow's season that he had. Now, granted, he had some weapons, but I, like, I'm not going to take it away from Tim. Tim had some weapons too. So let's not yeah. say there was nobody else out there. Well, that's, that's the first thing about Cam because Cam had no one at all. And he Cam knew what he kinda, did. Cam, Cam was good enough. Um, that's why I said it more talent. Cam's good enough to say, I'll do it by myself. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, like I always say that, like you go back and watch Percy Harvin highlight videos. We motion him in the backfield and run counter. Both <laughs> guards pull, hit each other and fall down. Right. <laughs> Both guards pull, hit each other and fall down. And Percy goes for 80. Like it didn't matter. Right? I, it's I like you draw it up. A great Percy story. We're it was like basketball. T-ball playing guard. I'm at, I'm, I'm at Mississippi State. It's a, one of the great ones. And Jeff Collins, our D coordinator, sitting there getting ready to watch the Super Bowl. And I said, Jeff, I'll tell you what. The Seahawks Super Bowl, we're playing. I said, wait till you see what Percy Harvin does in this Super Bowl. I said, I'll, get, I'll tell you this. The first time he touches the ball, he scores a touchdown because it's the Super Bowl. Jeff said, I just looked. I don't even think he's cleared to play in the game yet. He has the migraines. They're not even saying whether he was going to. I said, Jeff, one, it's Percy Two, it's the Super Bowl. He will play, and he'll score a touchdown the first time he touches the ball. He's laughing at me. There's no way, no way, no way. They kicked it to him, touchdown. Because, and that's at the NFL level. He could just, he could, you could, if he didn't want to be stopped, maybe you're not going to stop him, even in the NFL. Cam was that way at times. If he didn't want to be stopped, he wasn't going to be stopped. But, yeah. um, but Tebow had the speech. Like Tebow brings all the intangibles and everything, right? This college football and college football, not pros, not the not all this. College football. I love the university, right? You know, you know, I yeah. mean, I mean, Tim will bleed orange and blue to the day he dies. There's speeches, there's this in the workouts, making sure everybody there's tears, there's crying. I mean, the passion. Oh, yeah. You can't he's, a beast. <laughs> he, he's he's just different that way. That's why I think. It is hard pressed if you do make the argument. Now, like the greatest college football player of all times, it's hard to get past. Like, it, you can always make an argument for him at that top. Yep. Thank you. I agree. appreciate that. He's my yeah, number one. T Bob's the number one. Boy. Um, I mean, look, dude, you know, I saw Joe Burrow up close. It was so studio. It's like Captain America for us LSU folks. You don't say fucking no to Captain America. No, you, you, no, you vote for the you're top. Saying, you're saying I'm in the NFC, the AFC championship game with, with a, a minute and 10 seconds left. Like, I'd, I'd rather roll Joe Burrow out there. Yeah, 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 I feel that. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I'd rather roll Mahomes out there and we don't talk about his college football career. True. Uh, I'll say this, Coach. That 2019 LSU Florida game, I, I the LSU Florida rivalry is weird because not that many people, I think, outside of the schools, I don't know how much they know about it, but that was a hell of a game. Y'all were marching down the field with trash that night, and that atmosphere was insane. It was a, a big interception late in the game, with like Connor yeah. Curtis. It was, you know, that year with that team, you had to kind of score with them, and I thought we were mm-hmm. doing it. We kind of we threw a we threw an interception in the in the end zone, uh, yeah, and kind of that that ended up being kind of that that 
that ended up being the difference in the game because I would have like, hey, well, it would, like it was someone's going to make a mistake offensively uh, to kind of flinch first, and and that you know the one turnover uh, when you get in those type of games can cost you. You know, if you you have an offense that that off LSU. Coach, LSU really doesn't have a, correct me if I'm wrong, T, but like T, uh, a, a true rival. Obviously, Florida has Florida State. They have Georgia. Yeah, no, not really. LSU is kind of there. So I would feel like it would be more missed on the LSU side than the Florida side, but would it be missed if that day, if that game does go away? Anyway? Well, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I don't know if he's going to say yes. I wonder okay. if from Florida games would be missed. I think coaching, and I, I, you, you get this. It's like the Georgia Auburn game. There's whoever your crossover team was in the SEC, not and like over the last however many years, you you play one permanent. You always play the one permanent crossover. Uh, as crazy as it sounds, like at Mississippi State, I always felt K- we have Kentucky was our crossover. Mm-hmm. We felt that as that was kind of a rivalry game. Yeah. But you're yeah. going to play them every year from the East. And it, that was an important big game. And so I think for all of those schools, whoever your crossover is, and you can go through a bunch of them, Alabama, Tennessee, Florida, LSU, uh, you know, Georgia, Auburn, those, and those end up at Mississippi State, it was Kentucky. They end up being big games. Now, maybe some of the newer ones, like I think it's Texas A&M, South Carolina, Within those schools, that might be a bigger one um, to them personally, and it doesn't create that national buzz. But I think that always is a little bit of a rival game because it's who you always play from the other side. And I think that that always gives a, a, a little bit – there's always a little bit of an edginess to it. And very rarely do you get them in the championship game because mm-hmm. – Somebody won and someone lost that game in a count. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I go back, you know, in 06 uh, against Jamarcus Russell. We had a goal line stand at the end of the half and we end up beating LSU. I mean, that, that was the last team I would have wanted to see in, in, in Atlanta. I could promise you that. I, yeah. I, I didn't, I wanted nothing to do with them uh, in Atlanta in 06. And thankfully, we didn't have to play up for the free. <laughs> um, yeah, man. You know, those... I, I think that that that's what makes those such big games. Yeah, and I mean that era, our era, I guess of LSU Florida too is just crazy. It seemed like those were yeah. two of the top well, the fourth, teams in the country the every single year. You know, the fourth yeah. down game was wild. Mm-hmm. Jay Kester, that's my co-host on my morning show. He Florida fans still are in his mentions every day bitching about the five four downs. <laughs> I, I'm up in the box, like, oh my, not again, not again. Like, oh. oh man. <laughs> well, um, Coach Mullen, I, I I can't thank you enough, man. I we've already kept you so long. I, I could talk to you for hours and hours. Your insight is uh it's just it's so good, it's it's so rare and top notch. And uh, you know, uh happy. For you, the fam, the new gig, everything. Hope Lake Oconee's treating you well. Still very impressed that you can do a 360 on the wake surf. That is so much harder than it looks. Um, So congratulations there. And thank you so much for joining us again today on Snaps. Oh, man. Always great to be with you guys. I can't wait. We're ready for football to finally kick off this weekend. I think this season is going to be an unbelievable. And I think just because it's the last. It's it's. It's the last of this True. current era. I think next year college football is going to enter a little bit of a new era. Um, and things will be a little bit different. I mean, I can't wait. My most exciting conference this year. I think the playoff run is going to be pretty crazy because I think for the first time, I think it might be four conference champions is the four playoff teams. Oh, and that's oh. going to freak everybody in the Southeastern Conference out. That you have got to, no matter what you do, you better win. Chance game in Atlanta to get in. There's deep sweat forming on Aaron's head right now. I 12 and 0 in Atlanta, 12 and 0 might not do it this year.
That's what I'm saying. What are they going to do when they actually get punched in the mouth? We're not going to know. You remember Remember what we say, Aaron? What does Dan Carn say? Silk slippers on the – no, wooden clogs on the way up, silk slippers on the way down, okay? Down, baby. And happy over there in Athens. Coach Paul, thank you so much, man. You have a great day. You guys too. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank See you. Guys. Well, dude, I really could talk to Coach just for hours and hours okay. and hours. That guy is awesome. Um, all right, that'll do it for today's episode of Snaps. A uh, huge thank you for Coach for staying on with us so long. Uh, on tomorrow's episode, we'll preview two more Power Five conferences. We got the Big 12, as well as um, uh, we'll do another one tomorrow. Uh, also, yeah, maybe Big 12, Pac 12 tomorrow, right? Uh, as always, youtube.com slash at volume snaps. Like it, subscribe to it if you want to help the boys out. Thank you, huge thank you to everyone who does. Google Snaps podcast, rate review it. I'll check on the reviews tonight. Uh, we forgot an opening comment today. That's on us. Remember, you comment on the YouTube videos. You are entered to be the opening comment of the show. We'll get back to that tomorrow. That's on me. Um, Aaron, thank you so much, man. You have a good radio show. Appreciate it. See you, everyone. All right. And a huge thank you to Ryan Brumley, Pat Gunther, Adam Gracia, Danny Carnage, and Chris Tran for helping make the show happen. Big all thank you to you all. We love you. We'll be back with more snaps. Talking college football tomorrow.